Good to see everyone. Uh, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Thank you, Pastor. And thank you, church. It's been a great meeting so far, and I appreciate all the messages we've heard. And, and uh, we'll be listening on Facebook or YouTube to hear Brother Shepherd and Brother Kiger message tomorrow after we have our service, of course. But uh, this sermon, I think is, I think the Lord is doing, a, is working a theme. And uh, let's, uh, kind of goes along with, but maybe another little shade of meaning here. Look with me in the Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that uh, beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Verse 5 will be my key thoughts for today. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me... Ye can do nothing. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now needing you. Praying, Lord, that you'd be pleased once again to use us. Father, we ask that we would be used today to encourage us and to exalt thy son. Father, we pray for thy Holy Spirit. We want to encourage this church. We want to encourage the pastors, but we especially want to encourage Brother Paul Jackson. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing and will do and all that you do that we cannot do. For it's in your name we ask and pray. Amen. Uh, when Brother Paul called and asked me to come and preach, I said, uh, he usually gives subjects. And I said, Brother Paul, what, what, what subject are you going to give me this year? And he said, nothing. And I said, well, I can preach on that pretty good. I, I, I'm qualified to preach on nothing. And so uh, I'm going to preach on nothing. In verse 5, Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. And uh, I'll go a step forward. Uh, the reason why we can't do nothing without the Lord Jesus is because we are nothing without the Lord Jesus. Uh, in the first verse, he gives us one of the seven declarations of deity that we find in the Gospel of John, the I am statements. You know, it was the Lord and the, spoke to Moses and said, uh, who is it that has sent me? Moses asked, he said, say I am that I am. And seven times uh, our Lord declares himself to be the I am, the book of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. And today he says, I am the true vine. In this desert nomadic country and where in the Old Testament uh, and uh, the modern Jewish theology of the day was the nation of Israel was the vine. But Jesus wants them to know, I am the vine. I am the true vine. I, I believe that the Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of, of Abraham's seed. Not the seeds, but the seed. Now, I don't want to get off on that. But, but he is the true vine. And the vine, as I said, is a picture of life. And Jesus is the source of life and blessing in these verses. In verse 2, he contrasts between those who are superficially connected to the vine and appear to be a part of the vine 
and those that are truly connected to the vine. Now, this message being to Israel, there are many that are Israelites, not all that are Israel are Israel. Not all Israelites are saved. Uh, uh, not every member of a Baptist church is a saved member of a Baptist church. There's those that are part of the vine, but they're not really connected to the true vine. We see that in verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he, he purgeth it, and that it may bring forth more fruit. And so we see the, the contrast here. We can only bring forth fruit of the Lord when we're, contact, when we're con, connected to him. So a question can be asked, what is fruit? What is the fruit? Well, within the context, I think the fruit is pretty obvious. It's the natural extension of the vine. An apple tree bears apples because it's an apple tree, not to become an apple tree. A cherry tree gives cherries because it's a natural extension of a cherry tree. It's the works of Christ. It's the attitudes of Christ. And he mentions those, and we're going to mention a few of them in, in this chapter. Verse 7 and 8, it's answered prayer. Jesus was a man of prayer. No one ever, his, I never find his disciples saying, Lord, teach us how to preach. But I do find him saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he, and he teaches us that the, the, if you abide me, you'll have the fruit of prayer. Verses 9 and then in verse 17, we'll have the fruit of love. Loving one another. We'll have in verse 10, the fruit of obedience. It's just a natural thing to obey the Lord. Verse 11, we'll have the fruit of joy. And that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus in John chapter 17 said that he was dying on the cross, that his joy might be fulfilled in us. Joy is a fruit and evidence of salvation. Not only that, but we'll have friendship with Christ. A real relationship, not a man on a page, not a man that, that we think about as a historical narrative and historical character, but a real abiding relationship. When, when life has its way of kicking us in the guts, we know he's there. Amen. He's our friend. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother, the Bible says. Not only that, but we'll have lasting fruit in verse 16. He says you'll have fruit, he, and then he says you'll have more fruit, and then he says you'll have lasting fruit. Not only that, but we'll have persecution from the world because if they, as somebody have already said, if they hated him, they're going to hate you. We're not better than our master. We'll have holy inspired, Holy Spirit empowered truth for witnessing. To Christ. So Jesus said, every branch that's in me that bears fruit, he purges. Every branch that just seems like it's connected to me, that doesn't bear these fruit, God casts it away and even talks about putting it in an oven. So I've got a question for you. Do you bear fruit? Do you bear fruit? Do you have lasting love? Do you have a, a abiding prayer life? Do you have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Now, Brother Rob, I'm a baptized member of a Baptist church. So is Judas. I know the truth. So did Judas. Church membership's not on the list of fruit. Don't get me wrong. I believe every saved person ought to be follow the Lord in baptism, become a member of the church. But that's not on the list of what he says is abiding fruit. I tithe. Good. That's a good work. That's a good thing. But Jesus commended the Pharisees for their tithing even to their spice rack. But he says, but the deeper waiters of the matter of mercy and truth you've forsaken. So even lost Pharisees tithed. Mm. 
he gives us a, another list of fruit you can find, and we're not turning there, is in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, this great Sermon on the Mount. And what happens at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where he says, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. He simply makes a statement much like he says here, those that hear my words and does not do them. I liken him to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the storms came, the great was the fall of that house. But to the man who hears them and does them. I liken him to a wise builder who's built his house on a rock and when the storms come, the house stands. Verse 3 and 4, you cannot bear the fruit of Christ unless you're connected to Christ. So do we bear fruit? You have to abide in him, be connected to him permanently. The Bible says make your calling and election sure. Let me just ask you one question before we get down in the meat of the sermon here. How much time you spend in work this week praying? I mean, he's your friend. He's your Savior. He's your Lord. He rescued you. Bible says if you love me. So, you know, I mean, I mean, I talk with the people I love. I talk to them. I love to spend time with them. How much time do you spend with the Lord this week? Show me what you do and I'll show you who you are. This, this is, everybody abides in me. Now all of us are de completely dependent on God whether we realize it or not. And our culture in America, as many have spoken about, has grown so wicked, but we've gone into complete insanity and I'm not going to, we've had a lot of preaching on that. We'll just take that and I'll build on that. I don't have a list of it all, but we see it every day. We have, and we, but the problem is, is we have a lot of Christians trying to fix spiritual problems in America with physical means. Now, let me tell you something. You don't fix a physical problem with a spiritual mean, nor do you fix a spiritual problem with a physical mean. Churches are closing their doors like never before since COVID. And actually, if you look at the research, the churches that are closing their doors were the entertainment amusement houses that had everybody joining for this club and this club and this club. And, 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 uh, and uh, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them need to go out of business. Need to go out of business a long time ago. I, I, I think we're seeing a purging here. People say, uh, uh, we have a lot less Christians. I don't know that we have a lot less Christians. I just think we have a lot more real Christians. It's not, it's, it's, it's not so easy to, to play that part today. A lot of people went to church 40 years ago because that's all there was to do. Let's just be honest about it. And so we have a purging today. Churches are closing. And too often we try to do a work for God rather than having him do a work through us. And we've got all these answers. We've got all these answers. Uh, and we're trying to answer these questions with physical things and with, and with our own, and I'm guilty of it too, with our own ingenuity, our own thinking. And the church world has got together and they've thought up some things. They say, you know, now if we can get a Bible, people can understand. They'll read the Bible more. We'll be more spiritual. Well, how's that working out in America in the last 20 years? What's the fruit of it? What's the fruit of it? You know, uh, one of them quoted Dr. Brown, uh, ancient language scholar, who said, the problem with Greek for most of you preachers is a little bit of Greek knowledge is a dangerous thing. You know, just enough to get yourself in trouble. And that was the man who preached out of King James, by the way. Oh, forgive me. I'm sorry, we're trying to figure, if we, if we get better music and we can get uh, uh, more contemporary music and we, can, and we can make people feel more at home and make the church more seeker sensitive and make it feel a lot less like church, and we can do all these things. We can have this and we can be relative and we can feel the felt needs and we can do all these things. You're trying to combat a spiritual problem with 
of programs and methods, and there's nothing wrong with trying to think through some things. But they, but Jesus didn't say, without plans and programs in a youth group, you'll do nothing. He didn't say, without new Bibles or contemporary music, you'll do nothing. He said, without me, you'll do nothing. We got a lot that's going down that road. We've got a lot of pseudo-intellectualism that people are falling into these days. Academia. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm hearing a lot of stuff out there that, 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 that I wonder who they're studying after. One thing about me and Brother Paul, we're many years apart, but we had some of the same seminary professors. And, 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 and I remember Wallace York handed out his sermons to us and say, now boys, you can take some of this, you can take all of this, but none of it's mine. For it to be plagiarism, it would be my intellectual property. I get my sermons of the Lord and I hope it blesses you. We got people running around trying to claim, oh, this is mine and this is mine and this thought. There's no humility. I never seen Michael Jordan running around telling everybody he was the greatest basketball player there ever was. You know why he don't have to? And I've never seen the real scholars go around telling everybody how smart and how much Bible they knew. They didn't have to. They just preached. Now I'm going to get down. I got about 15 minutes here to make three points. Several years ago, I was talking, I was down and discouraged. Things don't always happen the way we want to in the ministry. We all get down. Sometimes we look at ourselves. And I was always taught that you, one great thing my mama always taught us is look to the older and the wiser. And yeah, I read some things about, I've never met Brother Paul, but when my daddy passed, I read some things about what he thought about him. So I wanted to contact him. And a few years after, and it's been more than a few years now, brother. It's been about 12 or 13 I've been down here. But a few years after that, I called him up and I said, Brother Paul, I, you know, we preachers, we get a lot of these different voices in our heads. And I said, Brother Paul, and he said this, I, we used to talk about it every week for years. And he said, uh, he said, Robbie, and I do, Robbie, you talk too much, you confuse some things. He said, it's real simple. I remember this. He said, I pray every morning for God to use me. To use me to love people, especially the people I pastor, to stand for truth, and to be a witness to who God would bring my way. I want you to know something. All that's listed that he just said there in chapter 15 is fruit. Dependence on the Lord is where it begins. Prayer is dependence on the Lord. We must abide in Christ if we want to produce fruit. We must begin our day with prayer life. More and more I'm around the older I get, the more and more I just see that you can like it or not, but John Rice said our failures are failures to pray. Now, he may have got a, long, a lot wrong, but he got that right. And our failures are a failure to pray. And I, 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 just, I just see that more and more. Brother uh, Mark said he was in ICU. I was in ICU about a year ago. And someone that was visiting with me said, the Lord say anything to you? I said, no, but you know, for an awful hyperactive person, I've just been really calm. And they said, well, they got y'all enough stuff to sedate a horse. <laughs> and you know what? I, I, it's at those moments. I mean, this has been a, maybe,
January, I preached the funeral of my sister. When you stand up there, you preach messages like that. Don't come talk to me about hermeneutics and homiletics. Talk to me about the abiding power of Christ. There's some things you can't do unless the Lord's with you. And there's no training that you can get that will bring you through that. Elder D.J. Ward used to say, the churches, the pulpits are filled with doctors and all the churches are sick. Because nobody's been to Holy Ghost University lately. I think he's right. First of all, love the people. That's what it says here. Look with me in a few verses here. Hearing is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Verse 8, so shall you be my disciples as the Father hath loved me. In the same way the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Look at verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. Love is of God because love is the love is is the source of God because God is love. Well, I wish I would have listened to my boyhood pastor, Brother Range, used to say, if you marry a lost one, you'll have a de the devil as your father-in-law. And puppy love will lead to a dog's life. And, and, and love is, 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 is not an emotion. Love is not sentimentality. Love is love of the truth and obedience. And it begins with the love of Christ. What I'm saying to you is, without the love of Christ, I have no love. I was joking with somebody earlier, and I was at a family thing. And one of my nieces said, Robbie, quit acting like a jerk. And the mama said, he ain't acting, honey. <laughs> You know, y'all know me, know it's true. I even think Terry's laughing so loud. But uh, anything I do that's good, it's the Lord Jesus. Amen. And when I, I, everything else is Robbie Jeffers. And it's like that with everybody. No matter what kind of mask they put on. You know, fruit is visible. I'll just say that fruit is visible. He said, you'll know them by your fruits. I don't have to go through here. Every one of you have told me so many times what he means to you and how much you love him. And I want to say something, and I, I don't think it's hitting any pastors in this room, but maybe somebody will hear it. I've talked to this man on the phone for 14 years. I've never heard him talk bad about his church members. And I can say that about very few preachers. Love will cover a multitude of sins. He brags on his people. Or he keeps quiet. And my daddy used to always say that. Now, if they'll talk about their own people, shy away. What do you think they'll do to you? Stand for truth. Stand for truth in verses 18 through 25. We see that we see... We see a whole lot here in 18 through 25. If the world hate you, you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. If the world loves you too much, uh, be careful when all men speak well of you, the Bible says. Uh, but, but because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. There's election and sanctification therefore the world hateth you remember the word that I said unto you the servant is not greater than his Lord now what is all this and you can read it on down through why did they hate him well we won't turn there but in, Act, but in John 18 he stands before Pilate and Pilate says they say you're the king of the Jews and he basically says, I have spoken the truth, and that's why I'm here. And you know what his pilot's response was? Same response that the world has today. What's truth? What's truth? What's true to you? You know, we hear these people going around saying, my truth. There is no my truth. If it's, if it, there's only the truth of God. There is the truth of God that he has revealed, and there is the truth of God that he reveals in science and nature and other things. But all truth is of Christ. 
Bible doesn't teach every truth. It doesn't teach men what men by nature can teach themselves. It teaches men by nature what they cannot teach themselves. Who God is, who, who is our creator, our purpose, and what this creator requires of us. We're to preach truth. We're to stand for truth. You know that in Revelation 21, 20, we won't turn there where it lists those that are going to burn in hell. And it lists, it lists, it lists a motley crew now. Uh, uh, it talks about the unbelieving and the indomitable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars. But you know the first group of people that it addressed? And the fearful. The, uh, what was the first result of Adam and Eve when they died, when they, when they sinned? They were hiding and they said, why are you hiding? We're afraid. The first result of sin was fear. The Bible says that perfect love casteth out all fear. That, 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 that we've not been given the spirit of fear, but of sound mind. I'm coming to a point on this. My, my, my point on this, that word fearful, you know, you can, uh, you can, you, you can literally translate it cowardly. But the cowardly, the cowardly is listed with adulterers and whoremongers and sorcerers. You know why? Because if you abide in him, you will stand against this world. You will. You know, you do it in love. But you still stand. Still stand. I, I had a, I, I'll just make a mention of this real quick. Uh, I've got a sermon on my phone by King Glish on the head covering. One of the best sermons, if not the best sermon I've ever heard on the head covering. I sent it out to a group of preachers, just preached it on sermon audio, that are my friends. I repeat that, that are my friends, that I consider them brothers in the faith, sound Baptist men who do not take that position. Now, I'm not always trying to be a stick in their crawl. But, you know, but, 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 but somebody's got to do it sometimes. Uh, 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 Ironside said, I've come to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. But you know what responses I'm getting? Just jokes, mockeries, lamp doilies, and all this other foolishness. Man does a serious exegetical study, brings out the language does a good, a great job, has much more of a scholarly mind than I can attempt to. And, wh and what do we get? Just a bunch of little insult putbacks. You know why? They can't deal with the text. And you know what? I'm going to continue to love them. But I'm going to continue. I'm not going to back up on head cover. We don't make it a test of fellowship. We don't do that. Or membership. Most of the women in my church, I've only been there a year. I'd say about a third where. Well, we'll be there a little longer and we'll teach on it. Some of them are starting to come to me and doing it. But my point is, we stand in love, but we still stand for truth. You can do it as, and you listen to that sermon and tell me that that is not the most meekest sermon I've ever heard anyone ever preach it from our position. And thou, and, and what is it? But mockery and ridicule. You know why? We got to stand on truth. We, we, we just got to stand on truth. Uh, we got to stand for the words of Christ. I'm sorry. I've, I'm sorry. You can get mad at me if you want to. I'm not trying to make anyone mad. I'm not trying to point anyone out. But every word of this Bible is inspired. And so I need an every word Bible. I need all the words of Christ. Now, do you believe what, where the Bible says in Matthew 16, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you believe that? Well, you won't find that in a new Bible. And that's why you won't find new Bible preachers in my pulpit. You don't have to have that position. I'm telling you what my position is. I'll still love you. That's my position. Well, we need to stand for the churches. We're, we're willing to do the church of the Lord. And the truth of the church. Stand for the gospel of Christ. I had another close dear friend here recently come up to me. He said, you're right. So what's going on? He, he, his friend, y'all, I don't think any of you know him, maybe one or two. Taking some of his people with him to some of these big conferences, you know, where they got the big preachers. 
the so-called big preacher, where you got to pay, where they charge you, you know. And I said, you better watch that. I'm going to love you, but you better watch that. He said, why? I said, you better watch that. Well, I know the truth. I know, but it, it tends to make fanboys. Guys get, I, I like a lot of those guys, but them guys that go there come back worshiping them fellas. And he came to me and he said, I got a bunch of men in my church that's turned into reform fanboys. I should have listened to you. You better watch. You better watch that. Just because just they agree with us on some things, you better, there's a reason why we stand with churches that stand for in the truth of the Lord's church. Because everything out there, we stand for the gospel of Christ. Thirdly and lastly, we'll go quick. Where Paul said, I just asked the Lord to use me to love the people. Stand for truth. And now I mentioned things that wasn't my list. Things Brother Paul stands for. And some of these things that I've listed, he's asked me to preach on before from this pulpit. So that's on my list. He used me as a witness. We need to quit blaming everything else and I'm preaching myself and get back out to the highways and hedges. Preachers are in love with their libraries and don't know what the hospital rooms and the sick beds and the ghetto doors are all about. And I'm not informing y'all anything. You know when he was a younger man, he knocked them doors and had many of you knock them. And when he was an older man, he was down there every morning with that red school field hoping that cup of coffee with the, at the restaurant. Was it Hardee's and then McDonald's? Trying to do what Gene Tiger was doing. Hey, come on over. With an open Bible. We're called to do an impossible work. I want to say this. We can look at everything that has been said here, and I agree, everything's bad. Let me tell you something. It's only going to get worse. Evil seducers likes worse and worse. Salvation's an impossible thing. I'm called to do an impossible work. You know, the, rich, the ruler, the rich young man walked away uh, from the Lord, sorrowful because he trusted in his riches. And Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go into heaven. And I mean, I take that as literal as that, a camel through a needle's eye. And uh, Peter said, Lord, then who can be saved? And he said, with men, this is impossible. But not with God. For with God, all things are possible. I remember as a young boy going with my dad down to Glasgow, Kentucky. To, they were selling off my Aunt Dovey's farm. 